Thank you so much for joining us and welcome. I've got Ollie with me today and we're going to be talking about the idea of a semi-autonomous organization. But before I get into the questions that I have for you, can you give everybody an introduction? Yeah, of course, Emma, and thanks, uh, thanks for having me on. Um, I think what you're doing is great and uh, I've been sort of connected through LinkedIn and it's, uh, it's good to finally get a chance to chat. Um, so, um, so yeah, thanks uh, again for having me on the uh, on the show. Um, what we do at Alpha Lake is um, we uh, we focus mainly in, in healthcare, but we work outside healthcare as well. But we're a, um, a workforce um, um, experience uh, platform. Uh, we have our own um, what we call our Alpha platform, which is a set of a suite of products. Um, which one is Alphabot for Teams, um, which is a, a, a what we call a HMI human machine interface to try and improve how um, uh, uh, people working in healthcare that are doing amazing jobs every day just to free up their time spent on administrative tasks and, and improve the flow of information across healthcare through reducing their, um, the burden on, on, on health workers. Um, we do a lot of work around sort of in the moment um, capture of information so it's not stacked up to the end of a shift and loses accuracy or, um, or, or efficiency as a result. So yeah, we've been developing our Alphabot for Teams platform um, uh, and adding more and more use cases and workflows into it um, because Microsoft Teams is used uh, heavily in, in healthcare. Um, and so a lot of people don't realize it's actually a, a, a great tool to interact with multiple other systems. So we, we, we've developed a bot that sits inside Teams. Um, that's, that's kind of our main, um, our main sort of uh, product. We then have um, uh, uh, what we call NLP Connect and API Connect, which are two modules um, that enable us to connect out to other automation platforms. So um, uh, people working in healthcare can trigger um, workflows and the bot goes and does the hard work and then it comes back to um, the user or a team or in healthcare we have MDTs, multidisciplinary multi teams, um, and they get updated on certain information and are able to interact with Alphabot and, and Alphabot goes and does a lot of the, the work behind the scenes on various different patient record systems. Um, so that's that's our main product, um, but we also work closely with a number of um, API, RPA and low code API platforms. So we're an automation consultancy as well, and we work with the likes of Workato as our main um, uh, uh, vision for what healthcare needs in terms of um, low code API uh, connectors. We've developed a, a bunch of connectors on Mercato uh, that sits on their community. So we've um, included ones like Cerner and Epic, which are two big clinical record systems used across healthcare globally, um, which enable people to connect onto these systems more easily. And then we work with um, RPA platforms like UiPath and um, um, Automation Anywhere, and most recently uh, Robocop for um, more sort of um, permanent billing approach to RPA. So yeah, we're a consultancy and technology integration partner for healthcare, but we also are building out our own sort of um, um, tech stack um, product stable. That's us. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm in Epic's backyard. So I'm very, we live in the same town. So I'm very familiar with the tool and it's kind of fun. To oh, have right. I didn't realize. Global company coming out of Verona, Wisconsin. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. I didn't know. That. Yeah. So to get us started with this conversation about semi-autonomous workplaces, the first question that I have for you, and I think this is, um, we're on the same page with the thought process of this, but a lot of times within our industry, people think that automation is coming in to take jobs or um, automate the people out of the process. But is your thought really that we should be focusing on automating people out of the process or augmenting the way that they work? Yeah, no, it's, it's, def it's absolutely definitely augmenting and that's not, I'm not just saying that because it's the, it's the nice thing to say to not scare people. Um, where we will be in 50 years time um, is probably um, maybe a, a, an interesting conversation for um, another day. But um, in terms of the here and now or the next five to 10 years, I think um, certainly um, we've always had um, technology that has enabled us to um, work more efficiently and, and whether from the first moment some clever caveman or woman um, uh, decided to uh, uh, hone a, um, uh, a piece of um, flint into a spear head. Um, we've been using tooling to improve the way we do things because we all inherently um, would like to just sit around doing nothing. I think there's a human nature that um, we're, we're, there's a, I mean, that's just, I'm being slightly um, um, facetious, but the, um, uh, the, the point I'm making is that we're, um, I think, uh, yeah, inherently trying to do things quickly and easily um, uh, and, and, and cut corners and be more efficient in how we do things. Um, and I think um, automation and, and technology has always 
um, changed how we do things, but it's never ultimately replaced us. Um, and I don't think, um, you know, that's going to happen for, um, without getting too deep into kind of, you know, um, uh, how we go hundreds of years from now. I think, um, yeah, at the moment, it's all about augmentation. And to be more specific, I think um, um, a lot of AI at the moment, the best applications of AI are where AI is, is assisting um, from a UX point of view. Um, you know, it's really actually how we're interacting, whether it's with certain social media platforms or certain tools that we use in, in our work or um, uh, in, in our sort of hobbies or whatever sort of digital tools we might be using. Um, increasingly, you're seeing that, or whether it's the digital assistance through Alexa and Google and things like that, and the voice assistants, um, it's it's really how um, that user experience has been enhanced through AI. The best AI that I see is is actually just little things in terms of how um, the machine learning would surface certain results in a search or something like that, or just the things that just make the way you interact with software just so much more efficient. And that that's where we're seeing the application of AI um, uh, a lot. Um, uh, in its, uh, the application of AI, you know, sort of working best at the moment is, 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 in, is, in, is in, I think, UX. Um, and, and the same um, can be said for automation. Um, uh, it's, it's about how we um, take away the, the, the burden from the user to just do what they do more quickly and obviously, um, you know, concentrate their efforts on things that where there is human value. And I talk a lot about human bridging. Um, so like um, the human bridging effect where it happens a huge amount in healthcare, it happens in lots of organizations, uh, lots of industries where you're just moving information from one place to another without really adding a huge amount of value add as a human. There obviously are things that as humans we're, we're very good at and whether that's certain soft skills or that's, you know, the human touch in, 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 in healthcare, um, the, the, you know, the interpersonal side of things, you know, we're still um, better at, um, at POTS uh, most of the time uh, at doing that. So um, I think obviously, you know, we need to focus on where the human value add exists and accentuate that and then and then just remove the um the, the unnecessary repetitive um uh, human bridging that goes on across industries so you kind of started to go after this idea of you know we're working to augment the the human capabilities and what we're really good at and give us the opportunity to be kind of that center of that process with those soft skills but what does, and so if we're not looking to replace people and we're looking to augment them, what does that reality look like for an organization when they've kind of reached this point of transformation and um, have augmented their team? If you could share your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think, um, Emma, it's ever going to, I think it's a constantly evolving thing. So I don't think it's a, a start and a finish. I think it's a, we are, to use a technology term, it's agile, it's not waterfall, we're not going to end up. And I think the only thing I'd add as well, um, from a UX point of view, is the idea that, um, you know, we build a product and then it's released and, you know, it's, it's, it's always about iterative. And actually, when you talk about process, it's so you learn the way we learn as we go into certain projects. So from an alpha lake point of view, we you know, sometimes you just need to get that MVP, the minimum viable product up, and then you and then you sort of review it and you finesse it and you revise it. And and, and actually, as you understand process, um, things come out of the, the the woodwork, so to speak, in terms of um, um, as you engage and as you troubleshoot and as you work together as a team with with customers and suppliers and whatever kind of project teams being put together, um, you, 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 you learn gradually. Sometimes it's not so. It, it, it's really important that you, you think about iteration and continuous improvement is a thing that I'm always um, sort of, you know, passionately sort of banging on about to anyone who cares to listen. Um, and, and I think um, that's really important in terms of um, in terms of how we think about things. So it's not a, you know, we start here and then we're in a finish, we're a finish line. It's constantly improving. Um, but in terms of what that might look like or, you know, how things we would progress to that, I think, um, I mentioned it earlier, but HMIs, human machine interfaces, um, is, is is something that I'm quite focused in on at the moment uh, in terms of what we're doing with Alphabot. But just generally, how do we as 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 humans interact with um, systems that are increasingly becoming more automated, or workflows in organisations? And, and organisations, by their very construct, are um, are a set of workflows. And I think um, 10, 20 years ago, we were. We would buy systems. Um, I'm still, and there's still a lot of people that think in this way. Um, and there's a lot of big systems that were going to get bought, big software um, overhauls. Um, sometimes you take sort of an 
um, an ERP platform or something like that, you know, could be sort of every 10, 15 years, you, a company might go and invest in a big platform like that. And, and I'm not saying that's gone away completely, but I think we need to start thinking more about, okay, what are we dealing with? What, 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 what organizations, what do organizations have within them at the moment in terms of software and, uh, and environments that people work within? Um, and then increasingly in a, in a SaaS world, everything is obviously, you know, there's a lot more what we used to call shadow IT, you know, a lot more technology is being acquired by people in the line of business that, um, that are driving the technology adoption in terms of how they improve the processes that they know best because they work with them as a department or, or, or any sort of um, division within an organization. So a lot of those needs are getting driven by the individual user teams and then they're actually acquiring technology that, that suits their needs, whether that's in marketing, whether that's in back office, HR, finance, whether it's in um, you know sales operations or in healthcare in the clinical setting. There's we see a lot of um, CCIOs coming through in, in healthcare now, clinical information, chief clinical information officers that are actually at the forefront of acquiring a technology that can help this, the flow of information across the organization. So I think um, uh, where we need to then start thinking about is how we interact with the um, human machine um, uh, interface. So, you know, that might be a bot within say Microsoft Teams or Slack, or we use Google chat actually a lot internally at Alphalake, which has improved a lot in the last couple of years. Um, but, um, we, um, you know, how do we interact with these processes? And if we, if we, if, 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 if it's a, if it's a process, like we do a lot around sort of obstacle character recognition and, 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 and sort of digitization services. So, you know, has that, you know, that even that process needs a, a HMI where the, um, the, the administration team, um, in terms of augmentation, are then actually looking to check that instead of scanning every single image in or entering every, every single document in or entering data in, um, manually every time they're just tweaking and checking that the, that the OCR has worked as it should. And is that name scanned correctly? And, and, um, and, and, and that sort of thing. So whether it's in, in digitization, there's always uh, often there's always a need for a human to kind of oversee and, and and now it might mean that in the scenario like that, instead of doing all the data entry manually, you're just working through a sort of um, a, a, a sort of an interface that is just presenting that information to you much more quickly and you're just tweaking it and changing it. It might be um, that's just a typical sort of back office scenario, but you've also got um, um, the whole sort of uh, way in which you might trigger a process in the first place. So um, it might be a classic example would be sort of something like HR onboarding, you know, following an interview, the HR manager just triggers an action to um, that hire someone essentially by uh, by calling a bot and that bot then goes and interacts with all the various different systems based on a set of commands. It comes back. One of the things I'm quite um, um, big on at the moment is is in the moment processing. So how can we improve the user experience and make it as efficient as possible so that um, you can capture that, that information in the moment. So what I mean by that is um, one of the powerful things about chatbots or digital assistants, as I prefer to call them, because chatbots have got a bit of a bad name for themselves. Um, a, an effective um, digital assistant is able to um, uh, say, we, we have a feature of an Alphabot, for example, which is um, alert to action. So I've alerted you as a, as, a, as a user or multiple users of an update that might be that a particular process has finished or an event has happened somewhere else in another software. Um, and, I'm, and I'm letting you know about this. And typically that might have been done through an email or just a phone call if we go back um, to the good old days of phone calls. Um, but it would get buried then at the bottom of an inbox. Whereas if I use a digital assistant, I can then encourage the person in that moment to respond by asking a follow up question. So I, I'm, I'm alerting you to this and then I'm asking you, but what do you want me to do about it? Do you want me as a digital assistant to go and do something else? Or would you like to assign this to a colleague? So it's encouraging and it's um, it's sort of stimulating more rapid process flow for an organization, which then means that you've then not got someone else putting it to the bottom of their inbox or putting it to a task list to do later, um, or indeed pass on to someone else, which you then get into that whole human bridging scenario. So there's a lot of little things you can do in terms of, so to come back to your question, sort of, um, the, uh, the, the, the sort of the way in which you can augment effectively is really in that sort of, um, that intersection between digital processes um, in the organization and how humans are sort of nudging that forward or being encouraged by the process itself, by the organization and the way you configure that to actually nudge the human forward. Um, so yeah, that sort of nudge theory um, is a really interesting area in terms of, and, and, and removing the, um, 
uh, a lot of the multitasking, which we all know is um, is 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 a is something that doesn't really we're not very good at as humans, male or female. <laughs> There we go. I like to pretend that I'm a really good multitasker. Um, as a mom, I think I like to to really say that I can do two things at once, but my husband will be the first person to tell you if I try to answer a text message while I'm in the middle of a conversation, my brain shuts off and goes to that one task. So anything that we can but, but do- But I think that's a serious point though. I think, cause there are, there's, there's types of multitasking, right? You know, so as a, as a, as a mom, you know, there is a, um, you know, the, the you would hope that you are programmed to be able to do certain things whilst doing something else. But that's a different type of multitasking to the sort of, I think, the fallacy of multitasking that exists in the workplace, which I think is different. It's about trying to do two jobs at once, which one might be mental, one might be physical, you know, holding a baby, doing something like that. that can almost become like um, um, you can do certain things that are then not requiring your full attention. You know, you can get into a bit of a sort of, um, but if you're trying to switch between tasks, I think that's a different thing to actually, it's, you know, to know, it's a different type of multitasking, isn't it, I think? Yeah. So you did touch on a number of capabilities during that last question where you were talking about how do we blend these technologies and human strengths to kind of nudge us forward or really get the organization to kind of be semi-autonomous and really require spot checks from the humans. Mm -hmm. But what I want is to warn everybody to grab a pencil and a piece of paper or get ready on your keyboard to kind of make a list of what are your um, suggested capabilities that organizations that are maybe striving to get to this semi-autonomous place or build this workplace that allows them to just nudge their humans forward, what are the types of capabilities they should be bringing into the organization? Okay, yeah, that's that's a great question. Thanks, Emma, for um, helping me to sort of distill it down. So yeah, as a, as a, as a guide, as a toolkit, if you like, um, my advice would be to, obviously there's technologies like RPA, Robotic Process Automation, which has had a, a lot of uh, focus over the last few years. Um, um, which uses screen-based um, um, uh, bots that can record human activity, and then if that um, activity, user activity, is done enough, then it can it's worth recording it and and then repeating that via uh, um, uh, an automation. Um, but I think there's an issue at the moment that a lot of um, organisations are sort of trying to use, and I've been sort of campaigning for this for a couple of years now. Um, that um, a lot of organisations are trying to use um, robotic process automation as a um, as a go to for all of their um, ways of automating. And I think that's dangerous. I think that's um, um, uh, dangerous in terms of you know the, some of the waste that can result from that um, in, in organisations investing in in licensing and acquiring technology and then trying to use that technology in, in, in every type of scenario um, what i would recommend um, anyone looking at this at the moment should do first of all is um, in looking at ways they can in better integrate and join up their processes um, would be to look at how how humans can interact with different um, systems um, you know can you reduce the amount of multitasking that's going on across multiple different systems and multi-logins and switching between different screens there's a great um book by um um uh i'll remember the author in a minute but it's called uh um uh rise of the rise of the humans i've actually got it here somewhere um which doesn't seem to be to hand here it is um, and we share the same heritage because i came up with rise of the humans as a hashtag it's dave coplin he's a great guy and uh, i've got a lot of time for dave and he wrote the rise of the humans and the first third of that book there's the book um the first third of that book is really all about the inefficiency of switching between tasks so look at what interfaces you're using are you asking your your staff and your workforce to use too many um interfaces and that's a big vision for the whole alphabet for teams that um, we're, we're developing um but also um can you look at event-based automation as i as i call it um and look at automation and integration as something that can happen at the same time so once you start to integrate um, you, you you can actually look at um, you know building workflow recipes that when these events happen in certain systems they trigger an action in a in a in a, in a consequential system somewhere else. So um, you know thinking about event based automation that is real time that's connected via APIs or increasingly low code no code versions of APIs. So taking an API that typically might have needed JSON develop you know people that can understand JSON to plug two APIs together. Instead of that, um, you know, looking at building connectors that mean that people like myself and other people that are not developers but have analytical minds can build processes that you can drag and drop 
certain events happening um, in those processes into these you know recipes and workflows um, and there's some great tools out there that can enable that uh, i mentioned earlier wakato which is it, it, for me they, they are leading in the market in terms of the vision of where we're going with automation and they've really helped me understand that and i've really embraced that um, so looking at technologies like low code connectors um, and then using the screen based rpa when needed um, and sort of um, sparingly um, using it as i call it in the right dosage um, to use a sort of um, a medical term. Um, but yeah, you know, I always say that, you know, in an automation program, I think 30% of it should be robotic process automation and 30% of it should be integration and, and process optimization. I think that integration was such a huge piece of making sure that you're simplifying what the end user experience is like and minimizing the amount of friction that they have when they're trying to complete their job. That's the ultimate goal is to make the life of a human simpler. So when we start adding in more and more capabilities that aren't integrated tightly, that's where I feel like a lot of the challenges come from. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, and I think the notion of citizen developers is um, over the years, that's kind of coming through as well. The citizen developer, I saw something on HFS research the other day, and they, 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 they um, have some interesting sort of um, thoughts around this. And, um, uh, and I, I think I agree with this point, which is that, that sort of this idea of, you know, everyone building their own bots and being able to do the configure RPA. Um, has it actually been borne out? I think what happens is you end up with people that, you know, whilst an RPA developer is using a GUI and they're not necessarily a full stack developer and they tend to have come from a more sort of analytical background, um, the nature of the work means that it's not a tool that most I don't think we're quite at this citizen developer utopia yet that I think um, maybe UiPath might have hoped we got their marketing might suggest and that's nothing against you ipad they are partner of and they, they're doing some great stuff but i think we're not quite there yet and i think when you get into the api connector world where you're not relying on the screen recording as much it does become that much that bit more drag and drop but we're still not, i mean you look at tools like zapier and um some of the automations like if this then that and things like that where you know they, that's why I, I first heard of the phrase recipe you know recipe was actually by iftt um, and 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 that was really um, you know several years ago, and that was in the consumer world. You know, automating certain workflows. You know, turning on your lights and your, your Tesla or whatever you know uh, warms up outside or whatever. That's not that's not an actual accurate example, but you know everything being automated in your consumer life. Um, and that's kind of so. I think we will get there where people just think in this way, and they and and, and organisations have and individuals and in organisations have the power to build workflows and do less of the, and, and yeah, people are becoming more and more tech savvy and, and hence that whole kind of line of business, you know, departments buying technology more from in a SaaS world. But um, I don't think we're quite at the kind of everyone building their own RPA bots. And I don't know if we ever will in, tr in the truest, purest sense of screen based RPA. And I even in the, the simplest sense, you said it yourself, you need to have a certain type of mindset to be strong at that, just the same way that you need to have the same certain type of personality to be a call center employee or a salesperson. And there's different skills that we all have. And so maybe it's not every single person, but hopefully we can make it more accessible over time. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to sit down with me for the conversation and um, encourage everybody, if you're not already, go over and follow Ali on LinkedIn. We've teamed up for a couple of other events in the past, um, but I know that there's great content coming out from your side of the world as well. Um, thank so you. thank you again for joining me and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, Emma. Thanks. Good to chat to you. Thanks. If you're looking for expert tips on how to get started with your transformation or looking to hone in on your approach, make sure that you subscribe to our channel to catch our weekly digital transformation talk series where we interview experts from around the world on how to make it happen.